Welcome to the FDOT webinar on speed management techniques. This material comes from the FDOT design manual, chapter 202, speed management. Chapter 202 was new for 2019, and it was designed to include strategies to allow folks to pick an appropriate speed for a given context classification. This chapter is primarily intended for low speed and very low speed conditions and for transition areas. And for the Florida Department of Transportation, very low speed is defined as being between 25 and 35 miles per hour, and low speed is 40 to 45 miles per hour. This chapter can be used on new construction or on 3R, but it was primarily intended for 3R conditions where reconstruction uh, or right-of-way options are limited. Having said that, it is possible and encouraged to use this for new construction. So if you are planning a new alignment, you're encouraged to take a look at FDM 202, look at the speed management techniques that are included here, particularly the ones related to horizontal curvature, and see if there are things that could be useful as you are uh, planning your new roadway alignment to make sure it's going to be at a speed that uh, will be appropriate for the context classification where you find the roadway. This chapter has four subsections. The first sub subsection describes the general intent of the chapter and how it relates to the concept of lane elimination or a road diet. The second chapter describes the speed management concepts that were used to uh, uh, provide the strategies here. And then the next chapter or next section describes each strategy and how you would use each of those strategies. And the final section describes transition zones and how to use these uh, speed management techniques within the chapter to effectively create transition zones between different context classifications and even within a context classification between different speeds within that classification. This chapter is actually designed to support FDM 201, which is our design controls chapter. Within FDM 201, you'll find this table, which has a range of design speeds that are assigned to each context classification. You can see them here circled in red. FDM 202 is designed to support FDM 201 by providing techniques to actually achieve those speeds in the lower uh, design speed ranges that you see there. So for C4, C5, and C6, and, and also for C2T, you see that we have some uh, speeds that are in the lower design speed range, and uh, this chapter is designed to help you uh, find ways to achieve those speeds. FDM 202 is based on national best practices. We scoured the nation and other DOTs to see what techniques were being used to achieve these lower speed conditions, and those are what's uh, contained in FDM 202. And you should note that uh, a lot of times folks will do a lane elimination or a road diet project, and one of the goals of that may actually be to reduce the speed of the roadway. So while we acknowledge that lane eliminations can have that effect, we don't actually uh, consider lane elimination in and of itself to be a speed management tool. Uh, lane elimination has its own chapter in the FDM, FDM 126, and there's a whole range of criteria and, and studies that have to go with that. But if you are doing a lane elimination and your goal is to achieve a lower operating speed on the roadway you know, as a result of the lane elimination, we encourage you to uh, use the techniques that are in FDM 202 and apply those to your new configuration as you're doing the lane elimination project. So that's how those two are intended to work together. So while you'll see lane, lane elimination mentioned in here, we don't cover it a whole lot because it, it has its own chapter elsewhere. And uh, in and of itself, lane elimination is not necessarily a speed management technique the way that we're using it here at Florida DOT. So first, let's cover a little, about, a little bit about the speed management concepts that uh, were used behind this chapter. And the idea here is to describe sort of the conceptual underpinnings of speed management. And the notion is that uh, while we've tried to capture national best practices here, it's quite possible there are other very reasonable ways and, and very intelligent and clever ways to reduce speeds or to manage speeds that uh, are not captured here. We don't claim to have every possible way of uh, speed management included in this section. So the hope is that by understanding some of the concepts behind building uh, a speed management technique, the designer or the planner may be able to come up uh, with a new idea, maybe some new ways for how you would uh, control the speeds on a roadway. So we thought it was worth a, a few paragraphs at least to explain kind of how, uh, how we deal with this. And then when you go into the rest of the chapter and you look at the tools, the tools will tell you sort of which conceptual underpinning uh, the tool is based on, which of the strategies. But it introduces in this section the, the, the concepts of enclosure, 
engagement, and deflection. And we'll talk about what each of those are actually and kind of give you some examples of those things as we look into this. So then the notion is that using each of these concepts, as I said, the designer may be able to create additional speed management techniques to uh, fit a specific circumstance. So we'll kind of go through what each of these are actually talking about. So for enclosure, what we're really uh, trying to achieve here is to uh, one, you want to get the feeling of the street as sort of being enclosed in an outdoor room. Now, this is the exact opposite of what we do for high-speed roadway design. For high speeds, we want everything well back from the roadway. We have clear zones and recovery areas, uh, all these things to encourage uh, and enable a safe high-speed movement. But we want to, when we want to create and operate in a low-speed environment, we find we actually have to reverse some of that. And so the notion behind enclosure is to actually bring things in and create a sense of being in a space for the motorist who's driving along through this area. And um, there's several ways that you can do that. We talk about these different techniques in here, but I just want to show some photographs and some examples of those. Here's one where you see you have buildings that are creating some enclosure along the street here on one side. The other street, the other side has been redeveloped over time, and you can see that the new development has pushed the buildings back a little ways from the street. That's not uncommon in some of these uh, downtown conditions. Uh, where, let's say, a, a town developed, uh, adopted a new zoning or development code maybe in the 70s or 80s, even the 90s, and that code really was enforcing more suburban standards, which was pushing the roadway back or pushing the buildings back from the roadway, maybe putting parking in front, things like that. So a lot of times you'll see this where the new stuff is pushed further back from the street, but the old stuff is really right behind the sidewalk. And that's actually where you want it, is right behind the sidewalk if you want to have this enclosure uh, as a speed management technique. You can also use things like on-street parking to help enclose, uh, create some of this enclosure. On-street parking is also a good engagement example, and I'll, I'll show that as well here in a moment. Here's some other, other examples that you can use to create enclosure. Uh, street trees can do this. In this situation here, the street trees are on the outside of the sidewalk. You could also, in some situations, put them between the sidewalk and the roadway. Uh, at FDOT, the trees have to be at least 18 inches behind the curb. Uh, that would be a little tight in this particular situation, but if you had a wider planting strip here, uh, you could very well put those trees there, and you can see that would provide even greater enclosure around the street using those street trees. But here the building itself is also providing some level of enclosure. Engagement is the concept that uh, as the motorist is driving through a corridor, there are things in the corridor that are competing for the motorist's attention. Again, this is the exact opposite of what we try to do for high-speed design. For high-speed design, we want the motorist to be completely focused on the road. In fact, they have to be focused about a half mile down the road so that they can have time to respond uh, to anything that they may, to, may need to respond to because that's how long it takes to see and respond to something at high-speed conditions. In low-speed, it's, it's really kind of the opposite. Uh, what we really want is a higher level of complexity and what this does is it actually forces the motorist to drive more slowly because they they just can't keep up with it all. And so they're trying to slow things down uh, and limit the amount of data and meter the amount of data that's coming into them. So they're being more engaged with the environment. Now, in traffic engineering circles, sometimes we'll talk about this as the concept of friction. We'll talk about friction between the parked car and the travel lane and friction between the pedestrians and friction between the uh, uh, traffic in the opposing lane and turning movements and all those things. Um, that's the exact same sort of thing. Because this is in the design manual, we did not use the term friction. Uh, for roadway design, friction has, a, has already been appropriated, as, has another meaning, and it's talking more about what happens when the tire meets the pavement, uh, and there are very specific values and, and, and meaning for that term in the design world. So we talk here about engagement instead, and it's really the same idea, though. You're talking about ways to um, engage the motorist and, and keep them alert and aware of what's going on in their uh, surroundings around them. So here we have an example in uh, Stewart, Florida, along um, A1A. And this is uh, some different examples of types of engagement that we have here. So we can see um, some bulb outs that have been included on this roadway. And um, these are actually uh, covered, and I'll show you in a few minutes. A lot of this material we're going to show you is actually already in other places in the FDM. What Chapter 202 does is tell you how to use it for speed management. So FDM 202.3.1, um, uh, 1 and 12, 11 and 12, that actually is the, um, uh, within the, the speed management chapter, tells you these are the exact tools that you would use. So it's, um, it's these bulb outs here um, and, and these median islands to um, squeeze the space down and, and create some engagement with the motorist. You can also see these signs here uh, that has a similar effect. 
Uh, some other engagement examples, people. Uh, and these conditions, and we find that on-street parking, of course, in our higher, more urban conditions, more urban classifications, in those situations, you're going to have people out walking around. And uh, that in and of itself is also engagement with the environment. Here's some examples um, of deflection. So deflection is one of the most powerful uh, concepts behind speed management, whereas uh, engagement and enclosure uh, work somewhat on a psychological level where the, the it, you know, it's kind of affecting the mind of the motorist and, and, and this illusion that you're in an outside room or it's creating uh, this uh, engagement with the, what's going on around you on the street. Those are sort of a psychological mental framework. Deflection is a little different. Deflection is, is physics. So you're physically deflecting the vehicle either horizontally, as shown in this roundabout here, or perhaps vertically. And we'll have some examples of that here in, just, in, a, in a couple of slides. Uh, and that has a, is one of the most effective ways to achieve speed management because no matter what you're thinking about or what you're doing, you're going to feel this in the seat of your pants. And when the motorist feels something in the seat of their pants, then uh, that gets their attention. And so any place that uh, you really are serious about getting your speed management down, if you can find a way to do it uh, and really achieve those lower speeds, deflection is, is, should always be in your toolbox there. This example here is on Amelia Parkway in District 2, which is in uh, Northeast Florida. Here's another example of a deflection. This is called a chicane, and if you look carefully here, you'll see that the center line of the roadway actually shifts. Uh, this is not a state road. This is in uh, Fernandina Beach, uh, Florida, and uh, which is also in District 2 in Northeast Florida, and this is their main street. Um, and what happens is you're driving down this roadway. If you look, they've actually flip-flopped some of the parking arrangements. So down here, they went to some parallel parking, and then uh, another block on, they actually flip-flop it again. And so as you drive down this roadway, every block or half block, in fact, the center line shifts. And the effect is that cars move very slowly here. With our speed gun, we clock them moving around 15 to 20 miles an hour, which is perfect for the conditions that you have here. So uh, this is a, a fairly extreme example of using chicaning, um, but uh, it's a very effective one. If you're trying to achieve these very, very low speeds, you can get those. We have some other examples of chicaning I'll show you later on that are on the state system, which are not quite uh, the, the level that, that this is, but uh, I thought this is a good example of chicaning and uh, one of the most effective ones that I've seen here in Florida. In addition to the horizontal deflection uh, through chicanes and roundabouts, we also have um, vertical deflection. So this is an example uh, in West Palm Beach. This is Clematis Street, which is a great street if you've ever been to West Palm Beach. It has a lot of great walkable design, and this is uh, one of the things that makes it that way. They have elevated the intersections here. So this is an example of vertical deflection. And you can see this in the photograph here, if you look carefully, so here's the curb reveal. This is actually the curb face, and you'll notice that as it approaches the um, the crosswalk area right here, you can see how the, 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 uh, the pavement actually rises to meet that. And so this area is actually raised up. And if you drive across it, you can kind of see sort of the humping effect here. So on all the approaches, you're actually are raising up and then back down again as you drive over it. And this has proven to be very effective for traffic calming. Uh, you can see some other techniques uh, being used there as well. Again, this is not a state road, but this is a, an example of something where you, if you needed to achieve a very low speed, uh, this is a great example of uh, uh, vertical deflection. Yeah, there you can see where the, uh, the curb is actually uh, going away as the roadway surface is rising up to meet this. Uh, this also can be used uh, in some situations to uh, address some drainage challenges. Um, if you're having, a lot of times we actually want the water to come back here to an inlet rather than be captured at the corner because in the corner it may interfere with where we want the pedestrians to cross. And so if you're uh, looking at, at this as a drainage situation, uh, you may also think of this as a possible solution to, to address drainage as well. So you kill several birds with one stone, as they say. This is a somewhat milder example of uh, vertical deflection. This is on A1A in St. Augustine in Florida in District 2. Um, this is not quite a speed hump or a raised sidewalk, but you can see there's a little bit of elevation there. As you drive over this with your motor vehicle, you, you do feel the bump there. It's, like I said, it's not really a speed hump that in, the, in the way that we typically associate that or a raised crosswalk necessarily, but uh, there is a little bit of vertical deflection there. And maybe the point here is that uh, there's, you know, there's a range at which you can do these things. Sure, we can, we can jack it up six inches and that'll really get your attention. If you decide maybe that's not what you need, maybe you only need it to come up a couple inches uh, to uh, get the point that, that folks are going to be crossing here and that you need to slow down. So 
Um, this is a, an example on a state road of where we use some vertical deflection here. So within the chapter, we also have a table uh, that talks about the strategies to achieve particular operating speed. So when you're trying to look for these strategies, here's some things you want to be thinking about, and you'll need to think about these in order to use this table. One, of course, is the context classification. You need to know where you are in space and where you fall on that context classification diagram. If you're not familiar with context classification, we have uh, webinars on that as well, and there's a context classification document that's on our website at uh, flcompletestreets.com, and you can go there and find out more about it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the context classes themselves in this webinar, though. You'll need to know the design speed of the roadway that you're operating on, and again, if this is a 3R uh, condition where it's resurfacing or reconstruction, the chances are you already had a design speed on that roadway when you got there. That road was already built. It was built at a certain design speed, and that's the design speed of the roadway. That may or may not be your desired operating speed, though. You may actually want traffic driving more slowly than that speed, uh, so you need to know uh, particularly the desired operating speed that you're trying to get the traffic to work at. It helps a lot to know what is the community vision for that roadway. In fact, I'm going to say that's essential as you move ahead on this. That can help you determine which of these strategies are most viable for you. It's most useful if the community actually has a written plan or a vision of some kind. They can say, yeah, this is what we're trying to do with this, uh, with this particular roadway and with our community. Uh, maybe they're thinking of a context classification change. Perhaps it's a C3C today. It's, it's got shopping centers all around it, and they're all ready to redevelop. And the community wants to redevelop those into town centers. And they're going to have new street grid built around them, and the buildings are going to come up to the street, and now they're going to need some on-street parking. Well, that's going to be a speed management tool that we can use. Or that may not be the case. It may be the case that um, they're... Um, wanting that to continue to be a, maybe a high capacity, a little bit higher speed corridor, and they're planning to have bike facilities there. And so that would not have as low of a, much of an impact on speed management. But uh, knowing what they want to do on that roadway will help the designer and the planner figure out which of these strategies are going to be most appropriate for this particular project. You need to know what multimodal needs there are there. Are there any... Um, is there transit in the area? Is there going to be uh, any kind of uh, bike or pet facility? Is there a regional trail system coming through? Uh, all of those things can help you determine which of these strategies are going to be most appropriate. Uh, including that, we also mentioned, you know, what are there, are there any particular safety needs that you're aware of that uh, you're trying to accomplish here? Is there a crash problem that needs to be addressed? All those things would uh, begin to feed into the, uh, the speed that you want the traffic to operate and the types of strategies that might be most appropriate for you. Um, I'm going to show you an example in a little bit of uh, using uh, mid-block crossings as a tool for speed management. And if you're trying to address a safety need where you have a lot of illegal mid-block crossings and people getting hit outside the crosswalk, it could be that you need additional crosswalks. So how are you going to get those? That's something that can be addressed in here and through the concept of um, uh, speed management can help you make uh, a safer crossing condition for the folks using that roadway. So knowing what these multimodal and safety needs are is going to be very important as you design your road. And of course you're going to need to know always the design vehicle and think about the emergency vehicle access. This is particularly important if you're looking at any kind of vertical deflection. So speed humps and raised intersections and those kinds of things. Um, the emergency services folks get very interested when you start talking about those kinds of designs because that can have an impact on their ability to quickly and safely uh, meet their needs for emergency services. So if there's a fire or someone gets hurt and they need emergency service, we want to be able to get those vehicles in and out quickly. Similar kind of thing, if it's a roadway that has a high percentage of large trucks, you know, certain, certain techniques are going to be uh, less favorable and others might be more favorable in those kind of situations. And so you can think about that as you're looking at the kind of strategies you want to use. So kind of go through this checklist and make sure you have everything in there uh, accounted for. And uh, finally, if there's uh, any access management concerns that you have, those need to be addressed as well. In Florida, when we talk about access management, we're usually talking about uh, the distance between signals, the distance between different types of uh, intersections that we would have. Is it a full access intersection? Is it a right in, right out? Um, is it something that only pedestrians would be crossing and, and vehicles would never go all the way through that intersection? Those are all access management uh, concerns and uh, questions, and that needs to be considered as you're trying to pick the right type of strategy for your speed management project. So each of the uh, strategies in the table I'm about to show you is further described in the text. So let's take a look here. 
at this table. So this is the table that's in there, 203 or 202.3.1, strategies to achieve the desired operating speed. So let's talk about how we use this table. You start by figuring out your context classification. You should already know that because you just did your uh, checklist, right? So you've got everything you need to know to do your project. So you look for your context classification, then you find the speed that you're trying to achieve for that, and then you look for the appropriate strategies. So here's my context classification, C1 through C6. Okay, I know where I'm gonna be. Let's say I'm gonna be in C4. Um, let's say my design speed that I'm trying to achieve is 30 miles an hour in C4. Okay, there's 30 miles an hour. And here's my strategies that I wanna look at for that. So some things to keep in mind for this. Um, the lower speed strategies would usually include the higher speed strategies as well. Now, what does that mean? So notice when it says uh, for 30 miles an hour, I use all the techniques that I would use for 35 to 45 miles an hour plus I might want to use chicanes, median islands in the curved sections, and a textured surface. So those are all things that I could be using. Um, so what are these other strategies? Well, it says that if I wanted to get my speeds down to 40 to 45 miles an hour, I would have these techniques here, roundabout, lane narrowing, etc. If I'm trying to get it down to 35, I would use all of those techniques plus a few more. And if I'm trying to get it down to 30, I would use all of these techniques plus a few more still. So the way that, that this works is the lower the speed that you want to go, the, the bigger the toolbox that you have to draw from. That makes sense. Uh, for high speed conditions, we do include the high speed conditions here uh, just so we could kind of cover all the bases for the different speeds, but really for speed management for high speed conditions, uh, we are pretty good at building high speed roads, been doing that for a long time, and we have whole chapters that are devoted to that, and uh, they will uh, uh, take you over to those chapters for the information that you need uh, for high speed conditions. So here's some tips uh, for the greatest effectiveness in your speed management uh, efforts. Use the, all the strategies that you can and, and use multiple strategies together. Uh, managing speed is really difficult. Uh, people get very good at driving at, uh, at high speeds and um, they get familiar with roadways and they know exactly where they can turn and just how far they can push it. So you really need to kind of pile it on as much as you can. As many of these strategies as you can bring, in, bring to bear, go ahead and do it. Um, it's very unlikely that any single tool you see in here is going to be able to achieve the speed management that you're looking for. You're going to have better success if you try to use as many of these as you can. So we're going to kind of look at each strategy, not each individual one, but just kind of point out how the strategies are described. You can see the descriptions are very brief. Here's three of them on one page for roundabouts, um, on-street parking, and for chicanes. And so uh, each, and this is in uh, section 202.3 of the uh, chapter. And so um, you also see that for each of these, the appropriate location within the FDM is also notified. So for instance, let's say you're looking at on-street parking. So we talk about on-street parking here, and then we tell you for the criteria on how to build on-street parking, go to FDM 210. Same kind of thing. If you're looking at roundabouts, we talk about using roundabouts for speed management, and then we say, go see FDM 213 for roundabout design criteria. That's because a lot of these strategies are already in the FDM. We've actually been using them for many years, some of these on, on the state roadway system. We haven't necessarily thought about them as speed management strategies before, because speed management's not necessarily been something we've been focused on. But the strategies were, were there already. We just never looked at how to put them together. So what these little paragraphs are talking about uh, is some guidance for how to use these different techniques specifically for speed management. So it's got some tips on that. So let's look at the on-street parking example again. So here at on-street parking, uh, it talks about uh, where you would use it, what's appropriate for it, and it also gives you some advice. So if you want to use on-street parking, it says here, for speed management, you want to avoid the following things. You want to try to not install a bicycle lane between the parking lane and the travel lane. Now, there's nothing wrong with installing a bicycle lane between the parking lane and the travel lane. FDOT has a standard for that. We use a seven-foot buffered bike lane that has a three-foot buffer in the door zone adjacent to the parking lane. And then we have a four-foot bicycle operating space adjacent to the travel lane. That's, that's a fine way to do it for providing a bike facility. However, if you do provide that bike facility that way, you've basically eliminated the role of the on-street parking as a speed management tool. So if your goal is speed management, then you want to avoid putting a bicycle lane in that condition. Similar kind of thing, if you have a, a travel lane next to an on-street parking lane, but then you decide, I'm gonna make that travel lane 14 feet wide so that people don't have to drive as close to the parked cars, well, you've just eliminated 
some of the engagement that you were getting from those parked cars in the travel lane and that engagement is what was creating the speed management that you wanted. So our advice here is just use travel lanes that are uh, uh, 11 feet wide or less if you're going to put the travel lane up against the on-street parking uh, for speed management. So there's a little, uh, you know, bits like that kind of scattered throughout each of these strategies to sort of give you some uh, guidance on how to use it uh, and ideas on how to use it more effectively for, um, for speed management. And so there's that, uh, the additional information about how to use it that way. Some of these uh, are techniques that we are sort of introducing conceptually for the first time as speed management uh, in the FDM. So here's some examples of it. We, we actually were able to include some color graphics, which is a, a new thing for our, uh, our FDOT design manual. Um, so in this one here, we're talking about uh, if you want, uh, if you have a long block and you're trying to manage the speeds along this roadway, or maybe you have a mid-block crossing problem where people are getting hit crossing mid-block and you decided to uh, chop this block into smaller sections. Uh, a couple ways, one way to do that is to add a mid-block crossing here you know, with a pedestrian refuge island. So that could give you uh, an opportunity to make this a smaller section or uh, two smaller blocks and, and break it into smaller pieces for speed management. So now if you want to do that, you're going to have to coordinate with your district traffic operations office and traffic operations engineer. So one of the things we point out in here is that some of these strategies are not necessarily just design strategies, they're also traffic engineering strategies, and so you'll need to talk with the operations folks. And wherever that's the case, uh, we try to point it out in the guidance as well. So for instance, one of the strategies that you can use is speed feedback signs. Earlier we were talking about situations where you might have big trucks coming through. If I have big trucks, I may be limited with the amount of uh, deflection that I can do. So uh, maybe chicanes are not going to be my best go-to strategy for there. And vertical deflection is certainly going to be very tricky uh, in those conditions. So how am I going to control the speeds in those conditions? Well, one thing you can do that really is, is irrespective of the type of vehicle you have is a speed feedback sign, say on the approach to a mid-block crossing. You want to make sure folks know how fast they're going and that they uh, will slow down to the appropriate speed for that area uh, at that crossing location you could use a speed feedback sign for that. You have to get with your district traffic operations office to talk about how that speed feedback sign would go in there, how it's going to work, and make sure that all the, all the uh, appropriate procedures are followed to make that happen. So uh, in various places throughout this chapter, you'll see a guidance to go and um, consult with your traffic operations office to make sure you're, you're doing things properly uh, with them. The last section of this talks about transition zones, and what we're talking about here is some strategies to help you get from one speed to another. Uh, so let's say, for instance, you're in a high-speed rural context, C2, and you're approaching a rural town, a C2T, and so I need to get my speed down from uh, 60 miles an hour down to uh, 30, 35, maybe 25 miles an hour as I pass through the middle of this small town just for a few blocks, I'll be at low speed, but I need to get down to that speed so I don't just blow through the town and, and um, create a safety issue perhaps there. So what we've done here is talk about uh, conceptually what these uh, different zones are, and you can see them uh, shown here. So here's my rural zone. Uh, that's my high speed condition. Here's my transition area where I'm trying to get down to a lower speed condition. And then here's my community zone where my lower speed condition exists. And so in the example I used earlier, this might be C2. I'm driving along through the country. I'm humming along at 60 miles an hour, um, feeling good on my way to get where I need to go. Uh, oh, look, there's a town coming up. Uh, I need to slow down as I pass through this town. And uh, because there's people walking around here, there's people parking on maybe in front of these stores, all kinds of stuff going on. This is a, this is a town. People live here and get out and work here and walk around and live their lives here. So we need to slow down as we approach that. So this is the area where I'm going to begin slowing down in my transition zone. And uh, this one shows a roundabout. It does not mean that you have to have a roundabout on the approach to every town in Florida. That would be kind of cool, but that's not what this is talking about. Uh, this is just saying that you need some kind of a, of a device to think about how you're going to slow those speeds down. In a lot of places, we have uh, we just drop the speed limit on the approach, and, this, and the typical section will change a little bit, and, and we'll show you some examples of that. But um, uh, in other places, uh, yeah, you may, you may find an opportunity to do something with some sort of deflection there. In this case, we're showing a roundabout. That doesn't mean you have to have a roundabout. That's just the example that was shown here. Certainly a roundabout is a really good way to take people from uh, a high speed condition, slow them down, and then just kind of spit them out the other end at low speed, uh, and then keep them at that speed until they get through the town. Now, of course, once you went through the town and you're coming out the other side, you, you sort of go through it in reverse, and then you're speeding back up again as you go away from the town. 
So as we uh, get into these uh, section, uh, in this section on transition zones, uh, we'll be pointing you back to the other uh, strategies. So we'll say, you should use on-street parking, but we don't describe it all again. We just point you back to 202.3 to look at, uh, at those uh, different strategies. So we have an example here. This is uh, the approach on uh, SR 636 to the small town of Otula, Florida in District 1. So as you're approaching uh, from the countryside here, you're moving at fairly high speed. And uh, as you begin to approach the town, the speed limit starts dropping. And I want to show you in a second some things that they've done uh, that the roadway itself does to actually sort of get you down to these low speeds. And then once you're in the town itself, uh, the speeds are very low. And you can see here in this town has a very uh, small, tight grid of streets. This is classic uh, downtown infrastructure, classic street design. And so uh, we're moving very slowly through here. And then as you pass on through the town, you're speeding up again. So uh, that's what we're, we're trying to preserve here is these low speed conditions and get you from high speed in the country down to low speed in the town. This, kind of, this is just one example to kind of show you uh, some of the things that were in the chapter. Uh, so here we have a situation where the lanes actually, you can, you can actually physically see here that these lanes are narrowing down. Uh, it's like a funnel. Uh, you also have some horizontal deflection. You can see as you're, as you're, if you're driving down this road at higher speed, you can see, wow, this road turns ahead of me, I'm going to have to do something to slow down. In fact, this is a good example of what's called a terminated vista. So rather than uh, looking, and you may have experienced this before on, uh, on roadways that have a very straight alignment, as you look out into infinity, uh, the road just kind of makes an, an X out in front of you and it looks like it really never ends. It just kind of goes on forever. And that is a, you know, that, that lends itself to high speed travel. For lower speed travel, we want to uh, avoid that infinity effect. And so what you do is you, you take that vista, that view into the distance, and you terminate it. And in this situation, it's terminated by a large oak tree. Uh, if you're in a town, this might have been a church, it might have been some public building, but usually you want something fairly substantial there uh, to let folks know that the road is, is no longer going straight through. You're going to have to turn and do something when you get to this point. Uh, in roundabouts, a lot of times we'll put some vertical element in the center island of the roundabout using the exact same principle. It's to let you know that there's something going on here and you need to be aware of it so you can uh, be prepared to take action as a motorist. So in this case, you can see that the road is going to cut back to my left and uh, I'm going to have to slow down uh, to make sure that I, can, uh, that I can deal with that on the approach. So this is my transition to a lower speed. If I go around this curve and on uh, another mile or so, then I'll be uh, in the town. All right, so I want to uh, show some examples. Uh, one project that actually incorporated a number of these different examples here, and I thought it would be a good, good way to kind of end this presentation and give you some uh, real-world examples of these things. So we, we laid all this out uh, in the book, and we went and, and scoured the country to find this information, and then we came back and discovered that, wow, there's already places in Florida where some of these have been done. They've been done for several years, and, uh, and they seem to be working pretty well. When we contacted the district folks about them and asked about it, they said, yeah, that, that's actually working the way we intended it to. To, and, uh, and we're pretty happy with it, and we would recommend other folks do it. So the example I want to use for you is in District 3, which is in North Florida, uh, and it's here in, um, uh, in the town of Fort Walton Beach, and it's right along their main street, which is on US 98. This is uh, Highway 98 that runs along the, the Gulf Coast of Florida here. It's a beautiful road here. You get a chance to drive it, um, and it goes through a lot of small towns, which is one of the nice things uh, about it. It makes it a very pleasant place to drive. Uh, however, it carries a lot of traffic, and we've had to do things to that roadway over the years to allow it to carry that traffic, and those things have tended to make it a higher speed road than maybe we would want uh, in all the conditions where we find it. So we'll kind of show how we put all this together. So here's our little section of, of Fort Walton Beach, and so some of the strategies that we've got in place there include horizontal deflection and chicanes. You can see as you're traveling along the roadway, uh, you actually will shift your path of travel in and back out again and in and then back out again as you go through. So you have several different shifts of alignment. Uh, those all are good speed management techniques. Uh, this is accomplished by inserting a median island here, which forces the traffic uh, to the outside. You'll also see that we've got some on-street parking. We have buildings that are enclosing the street, and there are some other uh, uh, management strategies you'll see as we get closer to the roadway. And we have some street view images of that to, to help us understand how that's working. Uh, so here's one. For instance, we have the speed feedback signs. Uh, we have these median islands and bulb outs here, which support the chicanes. 
We have a, um, a, re a rectangular rapid flashing beacon in this location in association with this mid-block crossing, and that's one of the techniques that's in the chapter. If you want to see what this road used to look like, this is how it was before, and uh, it had uh, it was a four-lane section with no center median, um, basically a straight shot through here. There was on-street parking. Um, there was a little mid-block crossing here, but, but uh, there was no island or anything like this. And so you can see that um, uh, over time they were able to develop this and, and to incorporate some of these other strategies here. This is what it looked like uh, in the past, um, and uh, you can see it would have been a much faster road in those conditions there. Uh, here's what it looks like today. Again, that's what it was in the past. So what they were able to do was add this center crossing island, and, and by doing that they actually in, in added this uh, chicane effect as well to get a little bit of horizontal deflection in there. So what it looks like at the street view, uh, you can see that the on-street parking that used to be here, of course, was removed because this is not enough room now for on-street parking, so they sacrificed a little bit of that in order to provide room for the mid-block crossing. You also have to make sure that you provide room for clear sight distance uh, for folks, and so that's, I think, part of what had part of what was going on with that as well. You can see the on-street parking. You can also see they installed these speed feedback signs. And what, these, are, these are actually pretty useful um, if you use them in the right way. So if they're just kind of stuck out by the side of the road, uh, not necessarily serving a purpose except to tell you how fast you're going, well, you know, that might be useful, it might not. Um, but when, when we use these in conjunction with a specific location and it's very clear why we want you to monitor your speed, for instance, if it's a school zone, um, then they can be much more effective. So in this situation, you can see that right here is the mid-block crossing location. And what we're trying to get you to do is to drop your speed so that you'll be ready to yield to any pedestrians who need to cross here. Because this is, a, this is an RRFB. It's a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. It's a yellow beacon, which means that you have to yield if somebody's there. But if there's nobody there, you, you could just drive safely on through. And you don't have to stop just because the light is flashing in that condition. But in order to stop, you've got to be driving slow enough that you can see and respond to the pedestrian who's about to step out into the roadway. So that's why we need you to drive at the slower speed. And what this speed feedback sign does is let you know if you're driving faster than that. And so you can adjust your speed. There are motorists who will drive fast no matter what's going on. It's just kind of their mode of operation all the time. They just got the pedal to the metal. Most people are not like that. Uh, most people drive around, and if you are, you may or may not be really paying attention. A lot of our driving is what's called automatic driving. We're just kind of doing it with another part of our brain while we're thinking about what we're, what we're going to do this weekend, or a problem at work, or or something like that. So um, uh, it's kind of an automatic driving. And what this does is sort of jar you out of that a little bit, along with this idea of engagement, and let you know, hey, did you know that you're driving 35 and you need to be. 25 through here, and oh, I, I hadn't realized that. I am. I'll, I'll slow down. And so, and, and most folks will respond to this in that way if they realize that they're um, exceeding the speed limit uh, where you're, you're supposed to be driving in this condition. So that's what these signs are for. If they're used appropriately, you know, they can be effective in that way. And again, this is a traffic operations intervention that your district traffic operations engineer needs to work with you on uh, to determine how this would work. Some other things that we see here, though, in addition to the speed feedback sign, you can see that we've got enclosure along the street. We have those street trees that we we're talking about. We have the on-street parking. Uh, here's some other examples of the on-street parking. The on-street parking is directly adjacent to the travel lane. Um, wow, I could be driving along through here and somebody could open a door. I might, I might hit their door. I had better slow down so that I can make sure, you know, that I can respond if something happens with these uh, parked cars. So the presence of those cars and the fact that I have to be engaged with them, you know, requires my attention as a motorist and, and will uh, help me know that I need to slow down in these locations. So that is the, uh, the extent of the webinar for FDM 202. If you have any questions about it, uh, please give me a call or an email. My phone number and contact information are here. I uh, hope you found the webinar useful, uh, and I hope you're able to use some of these techniques. If you have used these techniques and have some stories to share about them, they worked, they didn't work, you had a, a better way to do it, I uh, would love to hear about that from you. So uh, thank you very much.